Uh, this is about async testing on the JVM, uh, on, in, with Scala test on the JVM and Scala JS. It's something new in uh, Scala test 3.0. And 3.0 uh, is on its way out. I, I uh, released RC1 uh, two days ago before the conference started, but did not put it up on the website yet because I didn't get time to get the Scala doc out. So that'll come out in the next few days. Um, and I just wanted to give you a little preview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, these four functions I'm going to cover. Uh, so uh, the first one is actually JVM the platform. Before I get into async testing, I want to uh, kind of step back a second and, and give it, uh, put it into context. Um, what happened over a year ago is we decided to support Scala JS so that you could use, you can write tests in Scala tests to have them run on the JVM and have the same tests run on, on Scala JS if that's what your, your project does, right? So you have one full featured test framework that can be used on both. And we thought it would take nine days. It took, it's, well, it took over a year. And the reason is because when I first wrote Scala test and, and over the years, uh, uh, our team has been uh, uh, doing it and it was always really uh, on the JVM, so it was very tied to the JVM. And that's why it was so hard. Um, this first function is I think kind of representative of what's happened to Scala lately, is that it's, it's less, well, I mean, it's still very focused on the JVM because that's how it started. But now it runs on JavaScript, and in the previous hour there was a talk on Scala native, right? So it's now kind of being compiled to other targets. Um, so it's, you write things differently if that's what it is, right? If you're, you're trying to write libraries for it anyway. And uh, so a lot of what took uh, so much time is DJMifying, JM specific ifying, if I can use that as a verb, uh, Scala tests, sort of code base. Okay. So, uh, to uh, kind of give you an example of what the problem was, uh, this is anybody, well, I was going to say, does anybody know what API that's from? Serverless, you guys are so smart. Okay, and then I realized I wrote it up there in a comment, but uh, that is uh, how you handle a request in Java Serverless from years ago, 1990s. Um, and what you get when a request comes in from a client, a browser, is uh, a, a me this method is invoked, you implement this method, and you get a request object that has information about the request, and you get a response object, which is kind of like a, a wrapper around a socket. So what you do is you uh, look at the information in the request, and then you just interact with the client through the socket, essentially. And um, then when do get returns, the request response has finished. So you would actually not return until it's finished. So if you had to do something across an internal network like access a database that may take time t, you have to have that thread block, right? So that's uh, not the best use of resources. Back in the early days of the web, maybe it was okay, but now there's a lot more traffic coming in and people need to scale more. And I'm starting to sound like a reactive marketing talk, but essentially that's the idea of uh, like play and spray. Uh, what they did differently is, th is they, they try to get rid of blocking, the need to block. So the API is different, and you can actually block if you want in play. Uh, this is a play example. Um, and so what uh, I did is I have some intensive computation that uh, maybe it's out on a network, internal network or something. It gives me back a future int. So I can block uh, on that future, and then when it finishes, I'll get an int back. Right? And then I could return that to the client. That's, what that, that's what, how you do that. That's very unidiomatic in play. What you would normally do is actually map your response onto the future int. And now you get a future response, and you just return that future response to play. So you hopefully uh, have seen that kind of thing before. That's sort of the cool way to do it. And I was um, teaching the, uh, the play course a couple years ago. Um, and what everybody ha says is uh, you should never block in your production code, but it's okay to block in tests. And I think there are, it, it is different, and it, there are actually reasons for blocking your tests. Like, it, it's not the same problem. You're not trying to necessarily make maximum use of your resources, because it doesn't cost you that much to have, you know, usually just have, a, most people just have a CI Right? It doesn't matter how long it takes, they'll wait or whatever. Uh, and if you have too many things going at once, then tests can time out and you end up with test failure. So there's some use for blocking, but I got to wondering if, you know, why is it okay to block in your tests? 
that was sort of the idea that popped in my head. If you can return a future response to a web framework, why can't you return a future assertion to a test framework? So it would look like this. So instead of doing this blocking call on the future, getting the result back and then asserting and being finished, you just map the assertion onto the future that you have in your hand. It's very much like, like plays mapping a response. Okay, so I thought that was mildly interesting, but I didn't, I was not at all convinced it was useful. And, and, and if something's not useful, I don't want to put it in the library because the library is already too big. It's got a lot of stuff in it, so everything has to uh, be uh, worth it, right, to put it in. Um, and then when we we're about five months into ScholarJS uh, port, thinking it was going to take nine weeks, but now we think, oh my god, we, th we thought it was going to take nine weeks, and it took five months. Uh, we got this issue, uh, which is uh, this doesn't work. It, time, it uh, fails. And the reason is, is we didn't, so let me, uh, let me back up a second. Like one of the ways that the job, JavaScript is different than the JVM is JavaScript is kind of like AWT or Swing, where there's just one thread that does things. Uh, if there's just one thread in JavaScript going around in circles, and it has a do list, it's got a job queue, and it'll go around and it'll pick up the next job, it'll do it, and then it'll pick up the next job, and it'll do it, and that's all it ever does, right? So you really can't have anything multi-threaded in JavaScript. So that's why I thought, I was kind of naive about JavaScript, I was a Java person, and I uh, just didn't have experience, so I thought, well, we don't have to worry about it, anything multi-threaded, right? Um, but what you can do in JavaScript is call outside of the JavaScript VM. And now you're in the land of C code, uh, or Java code, which does have multiple threads. So you can actually call an API that outside the JavaScript, I mean, that, one of the jobs that, that JavaScript thread can do is call outside. And now you can have another thread doing something asynchronously while this continues. And then when it finishes, it'll stick something at, at the end of the, the job list, right? So there is actually ways to do things async. And that's what this call to sample service.getData was doing, is it went outside the VM, I mean, outside of JavaScript. So, Basically, what happens is immediately that this assertion happens, but it didn't complete yet, right? And future value, we did port it, because if you use, if you're not calling outside the, J, uh, the JavaScript VM, uh, and um, you use the run now execution context in JavaScript, this will actually work. So I wanted to port as, have as many things work on the JVM and JavaScript as you could so that there's more code that we, you could use to work on both, right? But on the JVM, future value blocks. So on JavaScript, it can't block, so it has to already be finished, right? So until this person posted this, we just thought it always would be because we didn't have the imagination to think people could call outside, which is pretty basic. But uh, anyway, when I looked at that, I realized the only way to fix that was this. We, have to, we, we can't block on JavaScript, you, there's no way to block. You don't have the choice, so you have to return a future assertion to the framework on JavaScript. And because we wanted to work on you know, the same on both, we either don't support ScholarJS or we implement this some kind of async testing. So that's, that was sort of what this talk is about, is how we got that in. That took another six months. And that wasn't the end of the story. There were other things we had, other major overhauls we had to do just to finally get through this process of un jm -ifying Scala test. So. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background before uh, I get into the async stuff, this is a ADT in Scala test that represents the result of a test. Uh, it's a you know, test has an outcome, and it's either succeeded, which is a singleton object. There's no information if a test succeeds. You don't care usually what, you don't usually care anything to know about it, just that it succeeded and didn't fail. If it's pending, we also have just a singleton object. That means it hasn't been implemented yet, or the code it tests hasn't been implemented yet. But Failed or canceled has an exception inside of it uh, because that's where actually you do want information and what you want is a stack trace to show you how you got there and what the problem was, a little hint of what the problem was, like one did not equal two or something. And that's called outcome. And then there's a method called with fixture, which you can, uh, you inherit from suite, so it's in every test class. It's a lifecycle method that you can override to do something with the test function. So this test uh, empty prints rocket outcome is the test function. It gets passed into with fixture. And then you could do, for example, some setup before. 
invoking the test function in a try, and then finally do the cleanup, right? So in, in the setup, you could put some stuff in the database, and then in the, finally you could clean it up, right? Uh, or you could do other things. You could actually change the outcome because the you know, test returns an outcome, and so does with fixture. So you could like catch something that's flickering and saying, well, let's try it one more time. If it, if it doesn't flicker that time, we'll call it canceled instead of failed or something like that, right? Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff you can do with fixture, but uh, you need to, I mean, the idea is that with fixture has to invoke the test function. So the default implementation does. So what I have recommended in the Scala doc is that you actually do this, which is calling the superclass implementation and having, and delegating to it to invoke the test function. So super.withfixture test is you're calling your super class implementation with fixture, passing the test function up to it. And the last one, the default one in suite, just invokes it, right? So it'll always get invoked. But that way you could stack several of these behaviors. And so one effect will happen, then another effect will happen, and then they'll, they'll un unhappen in the reverse order, right? So that's, two dot, that's in Scala test two. Um, and then usually people just override that in their test class, but occasionally if you have the same with fixture implementation in multiple test classes, uh, what you would do is factor it out into a mix-in trait, and then you just mix in that mix-in trait. Uh, so uh, this one is actually in Scala test, and so I, I say abstract override with fixture, and um, then here I said super with fixture test, that's delegating to the super class, and then we do something with the outcome here in this one. But uh, the point is what you do when you do this is you extend sweet mix-in, which is a bunch of abstract methods for lifecycle methods, and you have your self-type be sweet. That's Scala test two. Okay, so the summary of the, the situation that we face was users can define with fixture methods, and, and, and lots of people have, so that's existing code, and you can compose them by stacking treats. People call super with fixture test, and they have done that. And here was the real problem. It's, it was kind of like the serverlet API. I'm gonna back up and show you the, uh, by the types, the test is already finished when with fixture returns. Right, so because with fixture returns an outcome, it's either succeeded, failed, canceled, pending already. Right, so that doesn't work for async because it hasn't necessarily finished yet. You, you have a future assertion coming out of the test body. How do we get an outcome? You would have to block, right? So that was one of the big problems. Uh, how do we do that? Um, so the first thing I did is I didn't like, like it's a future of what, right? If you, if you map an assertion onto a test, you get a future what? I mean, in, in play, you get a future response, right? So I wanted to be able to, I wanted to be a future assertion because that's what it is conceptually. So I actually made a type alias called assertion uh, that is just the singleton type of succeeded. So what, if you have uh, anything of type assertion, it has to be type, it has to be the succeeded singleton. So that's the only possible value of that. So assert and matcher actually now return that. So if this, I can get this demo to work. Uh, oh, I think I forgot to say project Scala test. That would be better. Uh, just to sh console. Okay, that way. So if I say assert, let's say val x equals one, assert x equals two, you still get the same behavior. It will, when it, assertion fails, it throws in it the same exception, right? So that's the same. Um, but if it succeeds, it, instead of returning unit singleton now, it returns succeeded singleton. And it has type assertion. See, it's org skull test assertion. And then the same thing with matchers. I could say x should equal two, and it gives me the same exception it did before. Uh, but if it passes, it, instead of returning the unit singleton, unit value, it returns a succeeded singleton. And the reason for that is a couple things, but it was really motivated by, I, I don't want it to be future units or future any. And really the type of assertion in Scala test one and two were, was unit, because it's unit testing, I guess. Um, so there was really, it was just I didn't know any better and that's what I did, it was simple, it's what JUnit did. So now it's type assertion and it means succeeded. So that's the first thing. And then we, what we did is we made a set, a, more, basically, we, we added bloat. So for every style trait, uh, for, not for everyone, but for most of them, like fun suite, there's now an async fun suite. Uh, for fun spec, there's an async fun spec. Um, so what the difference is, is they're exactly the same, except the type of a test in async x 
is future assertion. So uh, you have to end it with a future assertion exactly. Um, so this, this uh, person who, uh, Chandra Code, or Code, who submitted that issue, this is how he'd fix his class. Um, and we fixed that in, well, we fixed it a long time ago, but um, I've now put RC1 up there already. So uh, that's what, how you do it today, is you, you just grab the future. This is in, on JavaScript, that is truly async, but, and so it immediately comes back, even though it's async, um, and the JavaScript thread will say, map on this assertion. And then it just, uh, it just, uh, returns that future assertion to Scalatess, and Scalatess puts it on the shelf just like Play did. It sort of registers a callback, and when that completes, whether it's JavaScript or JVM, then Scalatess, the callback, will, it's not a, you know, the request, uh, it's not the web browser client, it's just the reporter. It sends test succeeded, test failed, the same kind of events to the reporter, and that's, that's how it works. So, there's also an implicit conversion from assertion to future assertion. So you can mix them. If you have like a synchronal, like synchronous test, you don't happen to have a future, you can mix the two in this kind of style trait. Okay, so that's an async test. But this doesn't work, right? Because with fixture, the type of, you know, in the type signature, it says the thing's finished, right? You already have to have an outcome. So I, I, this was hard to figure out how to fit, fit in and make it nice. And um, so what we ended up doing is making two more bloat, two subclasses. Um, and I hadn't used the word test suite before. So with fixture was in class suite before, a trait suite. Now it's in test suite. So test suite and async test suite, that's the level at which with fixture, well, what the type of the test function is, that's what, where it's defined. So that's the only thing that changed is we moved with fixture down to this thing. And there's a new one for async that where the type is future outcome. And future outcome is something that wraps future square brackets outcome and makes a nicer API. So, so there's two with fixtures, but basically what, when you extend fun suite it, or fun spec, it extends test suite. So all your old code will work because it has the same with fixture. Um, async test suite is new, it has a different with fixture. It just has a different signature, one that makes sense. Uh, so um, the only thing is that this, kind of trait will break. And the way you fix it is you just put the word test in where it's dark purple. So that's a breaking change in 3.0. Uh, but it's, it, you know, I think this is, it's not uncommon, but it's not as common as just making with fixtures in your test class. So I think it shouldn't be too painful to upgrade. Uh, so that's, that's one breaking change. There aren't many, because um, we really worked hard to not have many. So, um, that's basically, you know, you do the same thing. I, like the, the default implementation of this with fixture is the same. It just invokes a test function. So when you say super with fixture test, it invokes a test function, but what comes back is a future outcome, right? And then there were other things that didn't work. So I'm gonna back up to the try finally example. I'll, I'll come back to this. But if there was one here where I had try finally, right here, this is sort of the idiomatic one. So if you set the fixture up, and then you call the super with fixture test, if it returns a future outcome, in the finite clause, you're doing your cleanup too fast because the future has necessarily completed. That means the test is not necessarily completed and you wanna wait until the test completes before you clean up. Does that make sense? So that doesn't work. Um, and there are some methods on future that can you know, like register callbacks, but they didn't quite work the same. And one, one of the things I wanted to try to do was make things work the same. So for example, uh, one of the methods on future ignores an exception thrown in the cleanup or the callback. Whereas here, if an exception was thrown in the finally, that actually overrides whatever happened before and that fails the test, right? So I thought that should happen. And then, oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm not usually popular, so I didn't think to turn off my phone. People don't call me, but. This is not a good time for me, so I will not take that call. But um, what was I talking about? No. Uh, yes, so there was another, there's another method that does, the other thing I wanted was that you don't, that you get a new future back. Uh, 
that, so that this test doesn't complete till the cleanup's finished, because that was true here. So let's say this cleanup takes five minutes. You don't want the test to finish until the cleanup's finished, because to make it the same. So we had to invent a new uh, syntax called complete lastly. Uh, so you, what complete takes anything uh, that's got a futuristic type class. So it's a future of anything or this future outcome thing that we created to make it a nicer API. Um, so it basically, it, this thing has to return something, either a, a future or a future outcome. And then if that blows up with an exception, then this works like finally, it immediately does the cleanup. But if it returns normally, then it's going to transform that futuristic thing, either a future outcome or a future of anything, into another futuristic thing, the same kind, future outcome or a future of anything, that will not complete until this cleanup code completes, and it will, um, if there, that blows up with an exception, the test fails with it. Okay, so that, that's complete lastly. Um, and then there's another thing that didn't work is like expecting exceptions. So in a future, you've got success and failure. If, if, if something blows up asynchronously, you basically get a try back because you're not there to catch a problem if something is, you've like fired off something asynchronously. So that's why try was invented so that uh, you could handle an exception that happened in a different thread, right? Um, so if you're now testing a future, you need to be able to, uh, well, do something like intercept or, you know, should throw this exception that should have this message kind of thing. But you have to do it in a future space. So this doesn't work. The first one doesn't work. And by the way, assert throws is a new, a new assertion that's just like intercept, except it returns assertion. Intercept returns exception, so it's not, it, you can't use it at the end of an async test body, because it's not type assertion. And you can always put succeed, that, that's just returns a succeed singleton. So there's always fail, cancel, and pending in Scala tests, and in 3.0 there's a succeed, so there are all, all of them there. And I think succeed, succeed, succeed is kind of good neuro-linguistic programming if you have that over and over in your test anyway. But it's, I, I kind of, I don't want to make you do that, so we added assert throws to, to indicate you expect this exception, but you don't care anything else about it, just that it's that exception. But essentially, if this future fails, the map won't happen, right? And if you do this outside here, this is saying that the thing that returns the future, it, you expect it to throw an exception, not that the future is expected to fail with that exception, right? So that doesn't work. So we had to invent a couple new, uh, you know, add more bloat, invent a couple new, uh, uh, assertions that work on futures. So the body here is a future. So recover to exception if, uh, recover is what it's called on future if you're expecting exception. That means you, you recover f and it, from, uh, from it and it change into something else. Um, there are methods there that we could, the reason we couldn't use any of those methods is they weren't specific enough. It would like it recover from any exception to this, right? We want to recover only if it's that exception in the test. Otherwise, we want it to fail, right? Just, and you get the same kind of message, expected illegal argument exception, but got uh, string index out of bounds exception, right? Um, so that one returns a future exception. So you can map another assertion onto it if you like care about what the message is. That's what recover to exception if. Recover to succeeded if uh, just checks to make sure that the future has failed with that exception. And if it has, it just returns a future assertion that has succeeded, right, which you can end the test with. So those are new. And um, all right, whoops. And so this is basically uh, a, a couple different things I want to just touch on. Um, what I have here is, is a async test with two tests that return, oh, I'm always giving away the answer. Um, but essentially, I didn't know, I mean, futures are usually used for parallel, right? Should this run in parallel by default? In Scala tests, tests don't usually run in parallel by default, but in futures, they usually do, so I just wasn't sure which one it should be. So I initially released milestones where it was in parallel because I just sort of thought that's what people would expect. Um, so that, you know, you say test, 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 you return this future and then this future and it would just, they could run in parallel and complete asynchronously in parallel. Um, but I got uh, some requests to, uh, to not do that. I think it was Ramnavas 
uh, that requested that, um, who gave a talk here, because they sometimes want to reuse the same database or fixture, they don't want them interfering. Uh, and it actually, that's why I made it the default anyway, is it's just simpler. Um, and if you really want it, you add parallel test execution. And the other reason was usually running your suites in parallel is enough parallelism to get the performance you want. And adding just tests isn't usually necessary. So that, that was sort of why I did it that way. And um, so that's the first thing is, is it, even though I can kind of copy this code, I think, these guys are um, returning futures like this. They do run one after the other. So to do that, what it has to do, uh, new add suite, is it actually, OK, so first the first test runs, and then the second test runs. So the way that works is we register running the second test as a callback on the future that represents the completion of the first test. And we, run, we register running the third test as a callback for the future that represents the running of the second test all the way on down. So it's just this big chain of futures. Uh, and so, so that's the default behavior. And if you, want, uh, if you really want it in parallel, you make some parallel test execution. And so I, I actually like that better once that they asked for that because it's consistent. And, and so then I really try to make everything consistent. Um, that's how it is in synchronous, and so this is how it is in async. It's, it's one after another, uh, and it's, um, if you want it to be in parallel, you mix in parallel test execution. Same trait. Okay, and then um, the other thing that I was worried about is uh, the reason I didn't have uh, async, I'm sorry, a parallel be the default in synchronous tests was I, if you really have tests in parallel, and people will sometimes share fixtures between tests, like mutable objects or bars as instance variables, and, and, and you actually need to think about synchronizing access to that if you have multiple threads hitting those things. Um, so just to keep that, like you don't have to usually think about it, I made it not the default. Um, so here, now you can have many futures, like you can have futures and then combine them, and like if there's different threads going on inside one test, you have that problem again. So uh, initially, we had a, uh, you had to specify an execution context. But I thought it was kind of annoying boilerplate. So I wanted to pick one. And they're different on JavaScript and the JVM. So I wasn't sure what to pick. But then there was that, also that problem of making, trying to make it less error prone with concurrency on the JVM. On JavaScript, you don't, it actually isn't a problem. But on JVM, it is. So what we did is we created a new execution context, which we internally call serial execution context. But that's the default. And the way it works is whenever you, like, like with that map, either of these maps will grab an implicit execution context. It grabs our execution context. And it, it doesn't give it to a, a thread pool. It just puts it onto one of those job queues, kind of like JavaScript has, and remembers that I need to do that eventually. Right? So that's what it does. And then when the future uh, completes, uh, the th uh, when the, I'm sorry, when the, it's not when the feature completes, when the thread returns and gives you the future back, that thread is now available. So what it does is it just goes through the job queue. So if it actually, uh, if it's really async, then the job queue can empty and the test hasn't finished yet. So I'm gonna, uh, I didn't put that as a comment. What do we do, and Victor can't answer, what do you guess we do when that happens? which is kind of crazy. I, I mean, it's crazy sounding, but I think it makes sense for testing. Anyone want to venture a guess? It's one syllable, rhymes with rock. Yeah, see, they're even afraid to say it. There's somebody over there that's brave enough to say, block? We block. Um, and that's only on the JVM, right? But the reason is, actually, it was Victor who was mentioned this, Victor Klang. He said that. You know, if you just get all these things running at once, they're going to start timing out, maybe. Maybe, and that's kind of what blocking did in synchronous testing, historically, is it did throttle how many tests are running at once. And so that's the default behavior. On the JVM, it will block. On the JavaScript, it can't. But, uh, but anyway, um, so that's serial execution context. And then uh, before and after, I just wanted to mention, that is like, I would recommend people, I always recommended people use with fixture anyway, because that's why it's, you don't have to mix anything in to use it. That was the sort of the recommended. But 
Everybody's familiar with setup and teardown in JUnit, and they, they kind of like to mix that in. Uh, they like it that way, so you just mix in one, one thing, and you get, you've got before and after. Um, that also works, even though it has to be uh, asyncified. And I had already made things async in 2.0, I thought, but when it was actually test became async, then I found that I hadn't done it right. There were bugs. Uh, it's just no one, uh, no one hit them because uh, everything was actually synchronous, right? So anyway, that's, that's uh, kind of an overview of, of some of the things. But I, I tried to make it as consistent as I could with the, tr the existing stuff so that it's at least you can kind of, uh, it's easier to go back and forth and sort of learn how to use the new stuff. So, um, OK, so uh, any, well, wait a minute, I have, that's this guy. So now I've got these three uh, t functions to talk about real quick. Um, Does anybody recognize this function? I just, this is the function that represents uh, the sort of economic uh, way of, 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 how would you call it, the a function of a how, when, you, when you're working on open source, essentially. Because uh, software is free, and uh, it, doesn't, it isn't free to make. It's kind of like freedom isn't free. So what I, I've been doing this for, uh, eight years or nine years or something, just because I, I really enjoy it. Um, and what, the way we funded it, we actually hired people and they work on it. We pay them to work on Scala tests, which is how we get through all this, this stuff. And um, uh, just funded it through consulting and training and books, things that we uh, sell. Plus, we get features uh, paid for sometimes, occasionally, but it's very iffy. So what I did, and the reason I'm bringing this up because I just deployed it to the website, is I, I, I wanted to uh, sort of explain myself. I'll show you the, uh, oh no, I won't, can't get the browser. Why not? Let me close that guy, there we go. Um, we came up with two ways to try and help fund the project that's more uh, dependable. And one of them is we're gonna put a, a very hopefully unannoying ad on the documentation and on the user guide. So that's called a sponsorship. And uh, what I try to do is make it, uh, because it's, it, there's a lot of traffic there and they're all Scala people, so I thought it would provide value to people uh, who wanted to support the project. So that's one of them. And uh, so it just rotates, it's the only place. It's sort of on every page and it's in the Scala doc too. Um, but uh, anyway, that's one thing, that's a sponsorship. And the other thing we did um, was I added a donate tab here. And this is more like crowdfunding for people who just like the framework and want to contribute a little to help. Um, you get a nice thank you gift, so a coffee cup, something branded, or a t-shirt, or, or some cheat sheets, and that sort of thing. So that's, uh, I just sort of wanted to explain that and, and uh, uh, sort of get feedback on if that bothers anybody. And, you know, it is always going to be free, but it, it wasn't free to create, so that's why I, I try to find some way to to uh, get some funding for it. So if anybody uh, thinks that uh, that uh, that might make sense for them, you just click on the donate button. You can pitch in. So that's this function. And then another thing I'd like to ask for help on is this guy, which is. I'm really busy. I don't have to try time to try out people's milestones and releases, but this one is a huge one. So anybody who has time to try it in their project, I would really appreciate it. Um, you can already try it today. It's out there. I just I, you might wait till I get this call the doc out, <laughs> but um, uh, and give me feedback. If it works great, then tell me that as well, because uh, I want to release this final in Berlin, and. Uh, that's, I think, four weeks away or five weeks away, something like that. So I need to, I need to, if there's a problem, I need to know about it as soon as possible. And then the last one is Q2A, which is you guys get to ask the questions, and I get left 10 minutes. I wanted to leave some time for you, for you guys to ask questions. Anybody have any questions? Yes, over here. I'm gonna... What do I use to test Scala tests? Not specs. Uh, I use Scala tests. Uh, and, you know, there's, it seems like, there's a potential that it could, there could be a bug that passes because of the bug. So I've always kind of wor worried slightly about that, but, but yeah, that's what we do. It's just like eating your own cupcakes or dog food. Uh, uh, how about you in the gray shirt? I'm gonna get my glasses on so I can see better. Yes. Um, so you mentioned uh, we have multiple 
uh, it hangs. So uh, what he, the question was, just to repeat the question, is uh, the, the tests by default, unless you mix in parallel test execution, uh, where is it, this one right here, the second test is sort of reg the running of that is registered as a callback on the first test future completing. If that one ever completes, then the whole thing hangs. That's true in synchronous tests, too. Uh, what you can do, in, actually, Heiko, that was another thing. Heiko asked, hey, how can I get a timeout in a test? Um, and I wanted it to work the same way. You mix in time-limited tests. It didn't work yet. So that took a few more weeks to get working. So if you, if you do have something hanging, then you just got to mix in the, the thing that kills it. Um, but that was also another thing that didn't really work the same in futures, because um, you can't cancel a future, really. Uh, what you can do is stop waiting for it. So the future still keeps going on in the background, uh, but the test moves on. And we mentioned that it failed, but the, the future is still, we can't kill it, uh, like, like tell it to stop. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that I forgot to mention was that parallel test execution, I didn't think made any sense on JavaScript. But actually, what you, if this is running on JavaScript and, and uh, add soon, let's say it was at one of those API calls that goes outside the JVM, let's say you have 10 of these and they take a minute each, it's kind of nice to start 10 of those tests at once and have them executing in parallel outside the, JVM, outside the JavaScript VM and then they complete. It would speed it up. So parallel test execution even works on JavaScript where there's just one thread and it makes sense. Uh, so I forgot to mention that before. Anyway, anybody else have a question? Yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, I don't think it would. The question is, will it take longer uh, because it's, ha it's in the future space um, on the continuous integration server, for example? And I don't think so. And I don't also think, I'm not convinced it will be any faster either. Uh, it's just on the JavaScript, it's the only way to do it. And on JVM, it's actually kind of, I think it's, what I liked about it before I even knew about the JavaScript stuff was that it was consistent. Like the way I write my production code, I don't want to block. I kind of like not changing that in the test. It kind of feels good. So I think that's the main benefit on the JVM. But um, it's just kind of uh, essentially uh, the, the mindset you need for Futures in general is you once you get in them, you stay in them. You don't block and get out. And why not do that in your tests too? It's basically on the JVM, I think, the main advantage. Anybody else? Okay, whoops. Just want to see what time it is. Uh, all right, I have two more minutes if there's one more question. Yes, you in the back. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, with uh, the parallel execution context, can you tell it how big the pool is? Um, OK, so uh, the way you do that is by selecting an implicit execution context uh, that does that. But what I didn't, basically, you, you, can, you can do that with the implicit execution context. You have to define it. Just define one here, say implicit you know, val execution context equals whatever, and then give it two threads or something. What we didn't do is integrate with the command line. And the command line, if you run tests in parallel, you can say how many uh, threads to use. That's the, how many threads are used to actually execute test suites in parallel and test methods or test, test bodies. But it's not, it's other threads that are in that execution context. We don't try to combine those two. So that's a separate, a separate thing. And then the other thing that's kind of clunky is the, the execution contexts are very different on JavaScript and JVM. So you have to like figure out how to get them. If you do override the execution context and you're doing it on both platforms, then you've got to figure out how to like manage that. It may be uh, you know, conditionally. I mean, that basically, I think you, everybody has come up with a way to do that on, when they're using Scala.js and JVM also. So it's just that. And I think that's all. No, oh, no, I have five more minutes. I forgot. Anyway, I can do another question. Otherwise, we can. Oh, yeah, there's one right there. The, the what? Yeah. 
No, it was just, I, it, basically the question was, uh, I kind of said bloat a couple times in, a, in, a, in, in like a self-critical way, and, and I just don't like it, but it's necessary. What I found is that uh, over time, I just like really small, simple things. That's my taste. And it started out pretty small and simple, but then this is now nine years old. And I've seen things go get ridiculously bloated, like uh, uh, Jira is so powerful, I can't figure out how to do simple things. And I don't want that to happen to Scala test. Uh, but if you don't do stuff, like people want async testing, and they want a test framework. That, they want Scala test to work on Scala JS. And I worked really hard to make, it, make sure that moving Doing that didn't hurt the JVM people because there's some people who don't care about Scala.js. So, and I think we did achieve that. But uh, we didn't achieve keeping it. I mean, it's still got more things in it. The one thing I would say about like that is that I, I did also try that everything in Scala test, there's usually traits, is very small and focused and just does a few things. And it's a little bit more like Unix has got tons of stuff in it. But you, you pick a few commands and you put them together and that's what you use. And that's kind of what Scaltis is. People, it's more like a, a, a library than a framework. And you grab the pieces you want, you mix them together, they, they fit together, and then that's simple. Uh, but anyway, I just, I kept it as simple as I could, but uh, it just seems like, uh, the other thing we're gonna do is we started moving, like deprecating some names, moving to package so we can do modularity. So like there are certain things, like JMock doesn't work on JavaScript. It, and so that should be a module. So if you, there will eventually be a Scala test core once we go through the deprecation of the names that's smaller. And I think that will, will help a little bit. Uh, and that's basically it. Yes? Do you have any plans for Ah, oh yes. Uh, the question is, do we have plans for AkaTestKit? And um, there, I think probably the background to that is that the AkaTestKit blocks. And, uh, so I was teaching in, uh, at uh, a company, uh, uh, advanced scholar, our advanced scholar class, and, and as a project, we took uh, AkaTestKit and we implemented it with uh, async, for, with features. And that, there is in Beaventers, it's on my GitHub. You can see, uh, well actually you can see who it is, it's Workday, everybody contributed it. Uh, that was the class. and, and, and uh, it's there, and we just have, we haven't done anything more with it. But it actually worked. It was really fun. Uh, everybody loved it because they could use the stuff that we were teaching, and actually for something that maybe people would use someday. But it, it's, it, you know, it's a. It, it actually might block behind the scenes now, but all the API is there. It's like we had to come up with names and all that. So, uh, I think that makes sense to have a, a Scala test plus Aka or a, a new version of test. I mean, that's very specific to Scala test. So maybe it's Scala test plus Aka that has that stuff in it. Uh, but yeah, we already started on that. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Property-based test? Oh yeah. Well, we integrate with Scala Check. So the question was uh, property-based testing. Um, we do integrate with Scala Check, but one of the, I mean, I I thought think of the Scala JS thing as the biggest yak shave of my life, because uh, yeah, I don't. You guys. Anybody familiar with what, why we say yak shave? I don't actually remember what the original story was, but somebody had to do something that seemed simple, but before he gets that done, he has to go do something else. But before he could do that, he had to do something else. And then, you know, at the end, sort of like the end of that, he had to actually shave a yak before he could do this. And he finally got everything done, he could do the simple thing, right? So because we were so tied to the JVM, we had to implement a bunch of stuff that seems ridiculous. That has nothing to do with JavaScript. Like, we used uh, resource bundles in Scala test because we're I'm a good I'm trying to be a good Java citizen and use Java's internationalization. Well, that doesn't work on Scala JS, so we had to implement a internationalization framework. <laughs> we did, and so we did, and we made it better because the one on the JVM you can you occasionally will get hey resource not found, and ours is statically type checked, statically checked, which is they should be right, um, but it's not general. We didn't do that. And we're not going to release it. It's just for us. Uh, it's a code generator, uh, but. <laughs> ScalaCheck didn't work on ScalaJS, but we use it in our own tests. So I found there were two other people who had come up with property-based test frameworks that, and one of which said they did work on ScalaJS, so we ported our thing to that. Uh, Chi Singh did that in Malaysia overnight. It, I thought it would be quick, but it actually didn't work. So he took a whole day 
uh, you know, trying to get it to work. And I, if he was doing that, I, I, it would have been better to just try to get Skullcheck to work. Uh, but it really didn't work. Uh, it was just, it's brand new, it's called Yaya. Yeah. Uh, so we actually wrote, started writing our own generator uh, inside Skeletest. And we used that, we just wrote this again, we just use it internally, it's just enough for us to get our tests working. Um, but I think it's different than skull checks and we may, you know, now that we're finished with this, that may actually come out someday. And there's, I had, what I want to add is some syntax for laws testing that is nice, that works with cats and skull Z and whatever. Uh, and so there, there's, you know, there's probably things coming in skull tests that actually address that more directly and, and not just the skull check integration, which will always continue to work though. Um, okay, that's, that's it, I think. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming, and uh, uh, please try RC1 out. Thanks.